Yeah. Okay, welcome everyone to the practical beekeeping workshop. We're just going to start with some introductions of who's who and you. So first up, we'd like to introduce Paul, and Paul will tell you a bit about himself. Yeah, hi, welcome to this afternoon session. Um, I'm Paul Badger, I come from Gisborne. I worked for the government for 33 years, and at 55 I decided to get out and go beekeeping. I thought if I left it any longer, it was going to be too late. And I've been beekeeping in Gisborne for the last 14 years. I'm presently in the process of trying to retire and be a full-time fly fisherman. Um, there's a few things I want to share with you today um, that would have helped me when I started, and I've, um, I've developed them over the time, and they're, they're on those handouts that you've got, so you've got a, a copy to take home. So, yeah, that's Paul Badger from Gisborne. And we've got Bryce Warner. Good afternoon everyone and thank you for attending. Yeah, I'm Bryce Horner. Um, I, uh, I'm from Milesgill down in the Deep Dark South. Um, I, I have a full-time job and like many of you, I'm, uh, I beekeep as well. Um, so I run a commercial operation uh, rearing queens and selling hives essentially. Um, I've done that for quite a number of years. Um, and I transitioned, like many of you may perhaps looking at, I transitioned from hobbyists through to commercial operation. Um, and went through um, the steps required to do that. and, and um, pitfalls along the way and, and hopefully we've got some pearls of wisdom we can uh, depart or get to you on um, about how to do that uh, that transition. Um, what I do now, I develop and deliver um, apiculture training essentially throughout New Zealand um, and, uh, and develop apiculture resources, so training resources. Um, I run, I have run beekeeping courses over a year, number of years for agribusiness training when they were around and uh, I currently run beekeeping courses and develop uh, training resources for Taratahi. Um, I also develop um, the disease packages, um, I'll, I'll part of the team to develop disease packages, in fact Paul and I worked for quite a while on, on the AFB courses and things and developing those um, and delivering those. Um, and I, I had a hand in developing the AFB app which some of you may or may not have um, on your phones. So um, essentially uh, yeah, my background is in, in the training and delivery things but uh, running commercial operation sort of in the background of all that and, uh, and have another job as well. And lastly, myself. So if you're wondering how to say that last surname, it is Kim Kniber. Um, and I, the bees found me. So I didn't think 15 years ago I'd be a beekeeper. But I kept having swarms landing in my trees and birdhouses. So they were telling me something. So I, I started as a hobbyist. Um, I run sort of small commercial now. I wish I was 20 years younger and um, perhaps could lift those 40 odd kilo boxes a bit better. Um, in the 15 years I uh, went and firstly belonged to a hobbyist club, Auckland Beekeepers Club, and I continue to belong to that and support those beekeepers there in, in learning and education. I have also become an AP2, that's an authorised person level 2, I think a couple of, we all are aren't we? Yes. So and yes I do do tutoring, um, I support the bee pathogen programs, yes like us, all of us um, and I um, also belong to the GIA and biosecurity focus group so I believe that that's important for our future. So that's the three of us. We're quite a diverse range because uh, throughout the country and also the number of hives we keep and, and the history that we have. So we're hoping that we can share that with you today. But first, before we start, um, I'm going to ask some questions of you. So I'd like to have a show of hands for those beekeepers that have been beekeeping less than one year. Right? Um, more than five years. Oh, come on, you should be... Doing here? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, anyway. Between... There's always something new to learn, isn't there? And there's always ten different answers to a question. 
So you'll probably get that today too at question time. I'd like to ask how many of you have between one and ten hives? Ten to fifty hives. Fifty to a hundred. Okay, and more than a hundred. Wow, what do we say to that guy? <laughs> you can probably teach me. No, um, so we, we really wanted to see what those numbers were, um, particularly for me, for when I'm saying some of the facts I'm, I'm going to share with you. Um, so the next we really want to point out is our subject matter. So you're going to get three presenters um, over the afternoon will share what we hope will help you build your future in beekeeping. So out of all of you, who wants to have more beehives? All right, okay. So we're hoping that we can help you build your beehives. Numbers. So our time frame this afternoon will be um, perhaps a little bit flexible. Uh, regards, we've started a little bit later, but we hope we can get you all out on time for afternoon tea. Um, Paul will be up first, and these are the topics he will be discussing with you. Then we will have a break for half an hour, and we'd really like you to stick to that, otherwise you might miss something in the afternoon. All right. Afternoon, um, I will be up, and um, I've got a few topics which really start right back at the beginning, okay? Handling your bees even. Uh, and then some of the legal requirements. We've got Bryce after that. And he's got topics again of great interest, I'm sure, to all of you. And um, throughout the afternoon, we might have some time for some questions. Um, I know that Bryce's um, program, he will interact with you with questions and answers, but we are dedicating some time later in the afternoon to answering your questions. So keep that in mind, keep that question, it is important, it might be answered for you as our presentation goes on in the afternoon. So, up. I'm just going to change that slide for you. I've already done that. Right, thanks Kim. Um, in your handout you've got a copy of this, so just whichever is easiest to look at, the one on the screen or um, the one in front of you. Now, the reason I've done this one is a, l a lot of new beekeepers say to me, I've only got half a box of bees, um, what's wrong with my hive? And I say, well, what, depends what time of year it is, you know, if it's now, if it's August, um, it's probably and it's got some honey in it, it's probably absolutely fine. Why are you worried about it? Um, if you're in the middle of November or towards the end of November, particularly up in Gisborne, well, you've got a problem. So let's just have a look at it. And the, if you look at the top line there, um, I've tried to just give an indication, and it is only an indication, of roughly how many bees you should have in a hive at a different times of year. Now, you've got to remember that these are... For me in the Gisborne, on the east coast of the North Island, um, so it's going to be different from if you're beekeeping up in Northland, and obviously you're going to be different if you're beekeeping down in the South Island. So you'd have to make one of these up and you'd have to slide your months along one way or the other. Uh, and also I've done it for Italian bees that build up uh, a bit more slowly than what carnies do. So the normal thing with a hive is the population drops in winter, uh, which is all very good because you don't need too many bees sitting there eating a whole lot of honey over the winter. Um, and the top line is, is what we look at for a normal population and if we, on the graph, it's showing up as the blue line. So it drops down, com comes up over the, over the spring-summer period and drops down again and, and just goes up and, up and down each year. Um, most insects play the numbers game. Um, it's mainly for their survival. Um, a lot of insects drop right down to very, very low numbers and sometimes only eggs over the winter. Um, bees over winter with a reasonable number of bees, but they drop their numbers as well. So why is the summer population so important? Um, you've probably all got a copy of Practical Beekeeping in New Zealand, but if you've got one of the older copies, you've got a real gem. 
because in there is a little chart, and when I read that, some lights went off in my head. The little, little chart gives a, gives a little table showing the numbers of bees in a, in a hive going into the honey flow and what the expected honey production from that hive is um, at the end, end of the honey season. And what it shows quite dramatically is as the population of bees going into the honey flow increases, um, your honey production goes up and it goes up more than proportionally. So the bees actually become more efficient because as the population goes up you have a lot more foragers, you don't need as many house bees, you still only need this, an X number of house bees whether you've got 30,000 bees in a hive or probably 60,000. Uh, the number of house bees doesn't go up as much. So your whole, your whole system becomes more efficient. Um, so if, if a hive gets up to 50 to 60,000 bees in time for the honey flow, um, the flowers happen, the weather's kind, um, we get a honey crop. Pretty simple really, when it all happens right. But it doesn't, it doesn't always work out that way. You can have hives above or below this blue line. Uh, the hives below are going to be stimulated by feeding sugar syrup, maybe pollen, um, possibly even feeding a bit of honey. If a, if a hive is really, really low, it won't take sugar syrup very well. Um, but always remember, if you are going to feed honey, be absolutely 110% sure of the AFP status that, of the hive that that frame came out of. So we probably, probably you've heard a lot of things from beekeepers talking about feeding and feeding and feeding, and some people do an awful lot of it. Um, I tend to only feed when it's necessary. I think it can be overdone. Um, so you've, you've probably been a bit of experience with that anyway, but I want to have to spend a bit more time on what happens to a hive that gets above, above the blue line. Um, the, you've got hives, in my case in Gisborne, I'll, I'll have some hives that have got two boxes of bees in early September. Um, and that's the red line, they've, they've built up ahead of it. They've probably come through the winter too strong um, and they've, they've got ahead of it. The chances are they've probably chewed up a fair bit of their honey, um, producing all those extra bees. But the reality is that they've built up four to six weeks too early. So what are they going to do? Um, they're going to bring in a bit of willow honey in September. October around our way there's not an awful lot for them. Um, and these are two factors, getting crowded um, and a, a drop in, in nectar flow is a couple of the things that help to induce a hive to swarm. So when a hive swarms, so what's the problem? You've got a swarm you might catch and you've got, so you've got two hives. Um, the problem is that half the bees take off. And if you look at the line where that, where that hive is swarmed, half the bees, it's gone from 50,000 down to 25,000 bees. Now it's going to build up again, but what's going to happen in that hive that's, that's left behind? You've got a new queen, she's got a mate, she's got to start laying eggs, so you, you've, got, you've got a break in the egg laying. Um, it's going to build up, but it's probably not going to build up um, until the honey flow is finished. So what we can say really is that um, probably the honey crop flew away with the bees for that year. You might have two hives if, you, if you're lucky to have caught the swarm, um, but of course you might not have been there and you might not, not have got it. So how do we tell if a hive is building up well in the spring or not? Um, we come along to a hive say in the um, end of August, September, it's got four frames of bees. Is it doing okay? Is it going ahead or is it going backwards? Okay, we can, we can hop in and have a look and see how, many frame, how much brood it's got. Um, what, what I started doing was recording the number of frames of bees on the lid. So I'd put the date and I'd put the number of frames covered in bees. Now, when you're counting your bees in a hive for, for, for doing a bee count, you've got to do it as soon as you take your lid off. Because if you've been in the hive and mucked around with it, the bees spread out, and those four frames of bees were probably spreading, covering six frames afterwards. 
So get in the habit of counting the frames of bees when you open a hive up, because that's, that's your assessment. It's got four frames of bees. Um, but if you've been there three weeks ago and you knew that it only had three frames, and it's got four frames now, well, OK, it's heading the right way. Um, but if you'd been there three weeks ago and you, you knew it had six frames of bees, and now you've got three, you've got a problem, haven't you? So when you've got a lot of hives, you can't remember how many, what state each hive was. And so this is where, see the frames of bees down here? Um, for, and I've listed it out for a single hive or a, or a double hive. It's just, it's just an indication, it's not rocket science, but if you get in the habit, you know, once you've got more than probably half a dozen hives, um, depends how good your memory is. If you've got 50 hives, you certainly can't remember. Just, so just write the date and the number of frames of bees. You, you can record the brood as well if you want, but that's, it's not absolutely necessary. Um, so if you come across a hive that's um, the, the one that's gone from the six frames down to the three frames, um, yeah, open it up, have a look. What's the problem? Have you lost your queen? Is she not laying very well? Um, have you forgotten to put your strips in, it's full of Roa and PMS. Um, there, there could be various problems with it. So that's just a, a practical way of actually um, managing your hive. So when you open a hive up, it actually, it actually means a lot more to you. Um, so I, I have hives in the spring, particularly the last couple of years. We've had a, wet, had a beautiful winter and then a, sh a shocking wet, cold spring. And you can have hives sitting on two or three frames of bees for weeks. And you, come, you come back in three weeks' time and it's still two or three frames. And you come back another two or three weeks' time and it's still sitting on three frames. So really should have done something a bit, bit, bit further back down the line, shouldn't I? I, you know, I, have, I haven't improved the, the situation. So if it had enough, if it had enough honey... Um, Maybe it was a queen problem, as I say, maybe, maybe, maybe I didn't put my strips in. Um, one thing I do with them sometimes, if they get, get to that stage and I'm, see I hunt, my honey flows about no, starting in November, um, I get through to December and they're still, in, oh, sorry, I get through to October, they're still doing that. Um, I'm, I'm actually liable to put two of them together as a two queenie unit for a while. Put, a, put some sheet of newspaper, queen excluder, put the other queen on top, and if you can, you know, they're only on one side of a box, make sure they're on top of each other. You've got more bees keeping each other warm, they come, become more efficient. And so, some, of, some of those give you a big surprise of how they suddenly take off. Um, you know, once, a, once a hive gets up to six, seven, eight frames of bees, you've got quite a bit of warmth there and the whole thing's starting to function well and um, they take off. But some of these ones that just sit, particularly in cold weather, um, they, they take quite a bit of getting going. Okay, so that's, that's just a quick, quick look at population and mainly looking at um, what happens when a hive swarms. Okay, so the next one I want, if you turn that page over to the back. Which one? Okay. Here we are. We have a thing that, that I call a seasonal management plan. Uh, this is just done on an Excel spreadsheet. Unfortunately, your ones on the paper, haven't, they didn't put the grid lines in, so it's going to be a bit hard to follow them through. But what I suggest if you're going to use this thing um, later on is that you actually make your own one up anyway, and it'll mean more to you. Now, you can write a management plan out longhand. Um, you, might, you might get down to five. It might take 10, 15 pages to write it. All the stuff that's on here in, in longhand, and, and print it out and put it in a folder, and I bet your boots, it sits in the back of the cupboard and it doesn't get opened um, until in about another two or three years' time. The idea is that this spreadsheet is just a summary um, of all the major functions that, that need to happen in a hive, um, in, yeah, in, in, in each individual hive or the group of hives uh, over the year. It's just a quick reference thing. So whether you want to call it a planning calendar, I. I call it a management plan. It's probably a bit of a grand name for a spreadsheet, really. What I've, because what I've found is over the past, there's a lot of new beekeepers. They ask me when they should do something in their hive, and it's often, when should I be putting my varroa strips in, or when should I be requeening? And an awful lot of times, I've got to say to them, well, 
Sorry, mate, but you really should have done that three weeks ago. You should be pulling your strips out, not putting them in. And timing is the one thing that with beekeeping, you want to be ahead of the game, not behind it. Um, and it's one of the absolute vital things to get to get right. I used to go and read the Bible, you know, the Practical Beekeeping New Zealand. When I started, I'd, I'd ring the, read the spring section and think, oh, this is what I've got to do. Um, and the idea of the, sp the spreadsheet is you can, for each month, you can go down in the column and whichever, whichever of those items are appearing in that column is what you've got to do for this month. And also look ahead at the next column because there may be some things you need to order or get prepared for the following month. Okay, and remember once again, this is for Gisborne, so you're going to have to adjust it for whichever part of the country you live in. Okay, so we'll, we'll look at just a few of these things. Um, I'm not going to go into each one in great detail, because we don't have time to do that. We could, we could spend a whole afternoon talking about Varroa. Um, but mainly in relation to how they fit into um, your seasonal plan. Okay, so a few things on the major ones. So, so Varroa, in the spring, okay, you want to have in there when your treatment needs to go in by. Now, I believe in spring, your treatment goes in to your hive, depending on more by when you've got to take it out. So when's your honey flow? You don't want treatment in while your honey flow is on. So if, you've got, if you're using an eight-week treatment, count back from when your honey flow goes, and your, hive, your, your treatment's got to at least be in by then. Uh, my case, um, my, my honey flow is starting in November, so my treatment's got to be in by the end of August. Otherwise, I'm not getting the full, treat, the full length out of that treatment, or else um, I'm pulling it out early. What, so, so strips do you use? Uh, strips, I, what I use in the spring is Baverol, as, as, and I use Apivar in the autumn. Although I don't really probably haven't got time to get into actually um, too much detail about the strips but we, we could do a bit more of that in question time if it comes up so the tre treatment goes in at least eight weeks in this case before it's got to come out so, so uh, you have have that in your plan um, down in the varroa monitoring and treatment in If you want to be specific, you could say, I want to have it in by the 20th of August. That's even better. You, you get it, you, you're you're finding tune, tuning your management plan down. If I, don't have a, if I don't have a date in there, which I haven't got on the, most of these ones, these are from some training courses I've been running, um, it's sort of got to be in by the end of the month, basically. You always want to start a little bit early because you, know, you could get a week's wet weather and you can't, you can't work your hives. Uh, most, most people tend to run late with their hives rather than early. Uh, the other thing in spring is you've got to consider your, what treatment you use. Make sure it's one that's not going to leave residue in your honey. Good idea to, to monitor um, before you put your treatment in and monitor again afterwards so you know Effect, how effective your treatment is, and if we have got any resistance showing up in your hives, um, you want to be able to pick that up early. So in the autumn, um, once again, once you've taken your honey off, get your treatment, and I say get your treatment in early before the mites build up too high. Because the autumn is the, is the crunch period, particularly for mites, in the spring, the, the bees can often outbreed the mites. If your mite level isn't too high, you've got, you've got an increasing, increasing brood area and it's increasing faster than what the mites are breeding. But in the autumn, your brood nest is shrinking and your mite numbers are going up. So you end up with more mites going into cells and this is when you start losing bees and getting PMS and all these other problems. So get your autumn in treatment early before the before mite numbers build up too high. Um, you want to be able to cover your, your treatment wants to be able to cover the robbing period because you don't really want to be opening your hives up during that period. 
and you really want to have it finished in time for your winter bees that are, get, that are going to be produced while you've got a low number of mites in your hives. Because one of the key things to beekeeping is to get your hives, not just worry about this season, everybody worries about the honey flow and, and what they're going to produce, but are you going to have hives for next season? So you want low numbers of mites going in and you want the low, low, mundi, sorry, low numbers of mites in the late autumn when you're going to produce these healthy bees that are going to last um, over the winter. And if, you, if you've got a tr a tr using a treatment that'll last two or three months uh, is better than using a real short-term treatment in the autumn. And yeah, as I said before, monitor at least monitor when your treatment comes out. You don't have to do every hive. My, my, what I tend to do, and I, I tend to use sugar shakes, I'll go in and I'll, I'll pick a, my hives are in groups of four, I'll pick a group of four at random and I'll do the whole four. And if I don't find any mites, or I find very, very low numbers, I'm happy with those ones, as I'm going through pulling the strips out, I'll just monitor the hives that, oh, this one doesn't look too good. I'm seeing a few deformed wing viruses, a few deformed wings in there, showing, I'm, showing I've got a bit of virus. Um, the population suddenly dropped for some reason. Um, I'll just monitor those individual hives. Uh, in theory, you should do everything, but um, it's not a perfect world. You've got, you've got to, you know, if you're running three or 400 hives, you've got to be practical about what you, what you can do. And it's better to do some monitoring than do none. Okay, so that's, that's the varroa line. Um, feeding. When are you going to start checking your hives for the honey reserves in the spring? That's one of the key things. Uh, for me, the first week of August, I go around and I just heft the hives. Do you know what hefting is? It's, it's when you get, put, put your fingers in, the, in the, one of the handholds in the hive with one hand and see if you can lift it off. If it pulls your fingers off and you drop the hive, well, you know it's definitely heavy enough. Uh, if it comes up real easy and think, oh, I could pick that, if it's a single, well, I could pick that up easily and throw it on the back of a truck, uh, probably needs a feed. But you'll have a lot of hives that are in between. So until you get your, a good feel for what hefting means, um, those in between hives, you, you'll tell the heavy ones, <laughs> you just you don't pick them up with one, with one hand very easily. Um, the in between ones, Take a few lids off and actually have a look, see, see what they've got. Now it's going to vary, um, hive weight varies quite a bit depending on, I've, I've got a real mixture of gear, I've got some with wooden lids, some with tin lids, some have got feeders on and some haven't. Um, if you've got a lot of old frames uh, that are clogged up, they're going to weigh heavier than, than, than light frames and boxes weigh differently. Um, so you've got to use a bit of discretion, it's, n it's not rocket science. But um, when I was running 400 hives, I could get around them all in about three days. Because I wouldn't, be, wouldn't have to be opening up many lids. And the idea of, my idea with that first round is I'm just trying to get into the hives, find the hives that have absolutely run out of honey over the winter. I don't look at my hives in July, August. I don't want to open them up. I want to just leave them quiet. You know, your queens will be starting as, from now on as the daylight hours increase, they'll be starting to lay. That'll be going on in there and, and it'll be, um, they'll be starting to eat a bit more honey. But if you put them into the winter with enough honey, they should get through, in, in my case, I believe that they get through till the end of August, uh, sorry, in, end of July, beginning of August, um, is the time to go around and do a quick check. And before I start doing all, all my main inspections. Um, spring, spring feeding can be overdone. Um, I, I know some guys, particularly if they employ staff, they say, well, it's easier just to t tell them to go out and feed every hive. Um, if, a, if a hive doesn't need it early spring and it's got enough honey and the population is looking reasonable, um, my thinking is you leave it alone I like my bees to come up naturally rather than artificially stimulating them because if you overstimulate them you can end up feeding a hive on and on um, and you, you, can make a, you can make a battle for your own, um, make a problem for your own shoulders. 
and you you can end up feeding and feeding. Um, had one mate that really got carried away. Said, "Oh, I'm going to get a real honey crop," and he fed and fed and fed, and all the bees flew away a week before the honey crop started. They all swarmed. He, he overcooked them. So that that graph, and you notice that on this on this management plan, I've got the bee numbers um, just just along the top there, just as a reference as well. So you're feeding, and for me, the latest I've had to feed is in November. Um, we had, had a year, one year, I remember we, the um, beautiful, had a nice wet winter like we've got at the moment, beautiful spring, the hives were building up well, put a honey box on in, in um, October, so much was coming in, and then the 1st of November it started raining, and it rained for a week and a half, and I went round the hives thinking, oh well, I even put some honey boxes on the truck, I thought, naively, thinking, oh well, some, something might need a bit more room. Um, when I opened them up, there'd been so little happening in the hives. They'd eaten all the honey, and they were starting to sabotage the brood. It was, it was fairly early on in my beekeeping career, and it, it was a real eye-opener to me. So every season is different. Normally, by then, I'm expecting a bit of honey to come in, not, not to be feeding bees. Um, I've he heard of people having to feed bees right right further, much, much, much further into the season. Okay, um, another line down here is AFB. Uh, so put in when you're going to do your major checks for AFB. And it's just a, it's a good memory jogger. Remember, of course, you should, you should be looking for AFB every time you pull a brood frame out. Um, queen cell raising. Are you going to make your own queen cells? And it's a good, good thing to learn to do if you, once you get, build the skills up to do it. Um, or you're going to order them in. If you're going to order them in, you probably needed to have done it a month or two ago. Okay, requeening. Uh, the ne next line. So in my, in my case, my main requeening was done in the autumn. And I was putting a protected cell into everything as soon as the honey came off. Uh, in spring, I'd only be replacing any queen that was that looked like a poor queen and wasn't laying well. Because when you when you produce using queen cells without removing the queen, you, you're probably only getting about 70% turnover. So you've got 30% of the old bees that are still floating around in your outfit. Now in the spring, there's only f three months between for me when the winter finishes provided it finishes at the end of July, <laughs> and, and the honey flow in November. So it's three months, it's only four brood cycles. So each of those brood cycles is pretty important because to get that population build up that we want. So we don't want too many breaks in the egg laying. Okay. Yeah, I'll just... Yeah. I, I'm getting a little bit behind time, so there's there's a few other things here. Um, swarm control and splits. Well, Bryce is going to be talking about those, um, but you need you need to have them in in the in the plan. Um, the next lines about supering, honey harvest, um, are pretty self-explanatory, and people don't tend to remember, they don't tend to forget those things. That's the because that's that's the fun part of beekeeping. Um, winter and autumn, do your stock take early. I've got down the bottom there, oh, in autumn, stock take, making up your new gear. So, as I said, we don't have time to go through the whole plan in, in great detail a bit, but each thing, but I just mainly want to get it out there as an idea. And what I want you to do, if you're going to use it, is make, make your own one up with your own time frames. If you've made it, you'll, you'll have a commitment to it, and actually having written it down, um, gives you gives you a lot more commitment to it. Okay, so that take that takes me on to the next one, um, hive and gear reconciliation, and this is something that a lot of beekeepers really struggle with. They actually don't know how much gear they've got, <laughs> uh, let alone how much they need. You've got gear in the field, you've got it in sheds, you've got it, some boxes have got frames and some boxes haven't. Um, so I came up with this. Really, just a simple spreadsheet. Uh, it's got everything across the across the top, 
and you just put your number of hives in there and if you've got some formulas in there, if you know how to make an Excel spreadsheet, it, it, actually, it actually works out um, all the numbers for you. So to know what, you, to know what you're going to have to order, this is, this is presuming you want to increase your hive numbers, okay? To know what you're going to order, you've got to know what you've got to have, you, you have already got, and then you can put, put your figure in down the bottom, and in this case, the example I've used, it's someone going from 60 hives to about 300. So it's somehow you've got, to, you've, you've got up to this stage of 60, and then you think you might want to take the next step to make it a full-time job. Um, and th this is a way of just working, working out the gear that you're going to need. Um, I've often had beekeepers come to me in December and say, oh, they've expanded their operation a bit, get to the week before Christmas, oh, I've run out of honey supers. We've got that good season, it's going on well, all, all my boxes are full. And in Gisborne, you know, we, we, we're still going to get quite a lot of multi-floral type honeys in, not so much Monica. Um, quite a lot of it's going to come in over, over January. And at that time of year, it's very hard to get boxes made up and painted and frames dipped and get the gear. You probably can't get it. Um, so what I've based this on, and I've just, just done it for simplicity on full depth gear. Um, so I've based it on full de five full depth boxes per hive, which will give you three honey supers. And so the th three of those five are honey supers. Um, and it works out on 47 frames a hive, so 10 in your brood boxes, 9 in your honey supers. So you can very quickly work out how much gear you're going to have to buy in. And when you look at the, look at the numbers down the bottom, it's, it's actually quite uh, mind-boggling. Now some adjustments you'll need to make to this is if you're, if you're running three-quarter honey supers, you're probably going to need more than three honey supers per hive. Um, do you have access to extraction during, as the season goes? Um, if you do, you might be able to get away with a few less. So, so you might be able to take some of your honey crop off, put those wet supers back on and carry on. And the other thing is how quickly do, do you plan to expand? Um, if it's going to take you a few years to expand, you're going to do it slowly, well you won't need all that gear in one year. So you might, you, you might have put the figure in at the bottom um, 200 instead of 300, depending on what you, what you think you're going to get up to. So what I suggest you make up your own spreadsheet with your own, you'll need the same categories along the top, but your own categories down the, down the side of what, what your different uh, lots of gear that you've got are, um, and, and, and work it out. Okay, so that takes me on to the next one, which is, we, we're going all right, Tom? Oh, hive more. expansion. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. Now, I'm sorry, this is, this is a rather complicated spreadsheet, and I don't blame you if you don't really understand it, but people say to me, how long does it take me to going to get from, in this case, 60 beehives up to 300? And what, what I've tried to do is just think about it logically and ma I've made the spreadsheet up so we can, for clients, I can, I can just punch in the number of hives they've got now, um, whether they want to buy some more hives and just give them some idea of, of how quickly you can expand. And in my experience with new people is it doesn't happen as fast as what people think it's going to. And the problem is they don't factor in the losses that are occurring naturally. The hive loss survey showed that we're getting, t over winter, we're getting 10% losses on average in beekeeping outfits. Some people are better than that, they can actually lose a lot more than that. Okay, and if you take the rest of the year, spring, summer and autumn, um, you're quite likely to lose another 10% as well. So you, you probably won't want to work on about 20% of hive losses per year. Now if you go out and buy 300 hives and you don't do any splits, and you're losing 20% a year, 60 hives a year, doesn't take you very long to turn 300 hives into 200, does it? So 
what, what I've used as my parameters in this spreadsheet is starting with 60 hives. So if we have 20% losses in the existing hives, we make splits, and if you get 80% of splits, so in other words, 20% of losses in your splits as well, just for, just, just for ease of working out, um, it's probably some reasonable idea of what, you get, what you're actually going to get out, out, of, out of your splitting and, and your building up. Uh, so the skills you need to learn is you need to be able to learn to make splits. And a lot of new beekeepers find that a reasonably hard skill to do. They, they don't, it doesn't always come naturally to a lot of people. Um, if you can raise your own queen cells, as I said before, um, it's a big help because you can get them when you want to. If not, you, you need access to a good supply of queen cells. And as the example down here shows, it's going to take you three summers to reach 252 hives. Starting now, with 60 hives. Um, the way, and I've based this on actually doing full box splits, presuming you haven't got a lot of nuke boxes. So the ways you can increase this and make it a bit faster is if you can make two five frame nukes instead of taking a full box split off. So that can give you two colonies. Oh, sure, they're going to start off a bit smaller, but if, you're, if your goal is to increase your numbers, that's a way to increase your numbers. Um, you could buy in a few extra hives, which is going to give you a little bit of a jump start at various, at various stages al along the line. Um, myself, I started from 300 hives. I got to, I got to, sorry, I, got, I started from 60 hives when I gave up with the government. Uh, and I got to 300 hives, I got there in two years. Um, but I'd managed to acquire about 70 nuke boxes. Someone was throwing them away. Years before I needed them and I thought, oh, I can't, can't, can't have them going to waste. <laughs> but I put them to good use. Um, I was experienced in raising my own cells and I was experienced in splitting. So you don't need to keep that one. That's, that's really just an indication that it's not going to probably happen quite as fast as what you think because each time you make a split, you think you've got, you've got 100 hives and you make another 20 up, you don't end up with 120. <laughs> you've got to factor in those losses. OK. We go. Good? OK. OK, last slide. Going, uh, so you're going to go to commercial. You're going to take the big step. We've looked at, we've looked at increasing hive numbers and how difficult that can be. Um, how are you going to finance your, your expansion? Are you going to borrow money? Or are you going to build up from the money within the business and take a bit longer to do it? Um, I'm not going to go into this because Bryce is going to be talking about this stuff later on. How many hives do I, do I need to go commercial? It's a, it's a bit of a long-ended question, this one. But in my opinion, one man can look after three or four hundred hives if they're going to be well managed. You'll hear of people looking after six, seven hundred, but boy, they must be rushing around and I, I, I don't believe you can manage them well doing that number. And I believe in managing a smaller number well and getting higher production out of them than trying to, trying to go for the big, big numbers. Returns, of course, were going to vary between season um, and whether some or all of your hives are, are maybe on a high value manga crop. But if you're doing budgets, don't estimate too high. Be realistic because you get huge changes. This last season, my hives, uh, last three years I've been running about 130 hives, trying to be semi retired. Um, Last season I did 16 kg of honey per hive. The season before that I did 60. So what should I budget on? <laughs> yeah. For me it's just a hobby at the moment. It's, it's, as I say, I'm, I'm trying to be a fly fisherman, not a beekeeper. But oh, yeah, I would suggest you need three or 400 hives as a, as a one-man operation to start with. And you can build up from there if you need to. 
So how many sites do I need? It takes a few seasons to work out what a site can carry. Start on the lower side and build up if you find that they're doing well. I would suggest that perhaps 30 hives per site for a wintering site is probably a max. Um, if you can reduce that number even lower, your losses will be lower. Your percentage of losses will be lower. Um, we've got a commercial outfit that's just moved into our area and I see they're doing dumps of 80. It'll be interesting to see how many they've got on those sites in the spring. Um, and un unfortunately some of them are buying some, a couple of my sites too. Um, for, for a summer site, um, I would recommend, you know, if it's a good summer site, you probably should be able to do 40. Most of my Manuka sites I used to do 40. Um, had one really good one. I did 40. I had two sites on the one farm. So I thought, oh, just see, they, did, they both did well. So the best site, next year I did 50. And they still produced about the same amount of honey per hive. The next year I went up to 60. And I, and I kept the other site at, at, at 40. And I just felt I'd knock the top off the, the honey production per hive. So I reckon that was about the carrying capacity. The carrying capacity of that site now will be much less because there's, a, there's, a, there's an, another beekeeper 300 metres down the road. So the things you've got to look at, you've got to look over the fence. You know, the flying range of bees, you know, three or four kilometres easily. Um, how many other hives are there in the area? That's going to affect your carrying capacity on your site as well. And overcrowding up in the North Island on the Manuka sites is becoming a real issue. Okay, a couple more points I need to make. Record keeping. Um, as your hive numbers get up, you definitely need to keep records. Um, even as a hobbyist, a lot of, a lot of people would like to do it. Um, just to see how they go from year to year. So keeping good records is absolutely vital. And what I suggest you use as a yard book, don't use a, just an ordinary diary with, that, you, that you buy from the store with, with you know, a daily diary, because you can, you can never look back and actually find what you did to that yard at, at the right time. I saw, saw one, met one guy who was actually using a diary like that. And it was absolutely hopeless. I'd say, oh, what, what, what did you do here last time? It would take him 10 minutes to find the page. So you can make a yard book up however you like. I just print them out on an Excel spreadsheet and have a column for date. Column for biggest part of the column is for comments. Um, I have my hive numbers on the right hand side and I also have a column that I headed, headed up next visit. So if I get there and think, oh, I need another two bases for this hive, or I've got a couple of rotten boxes and I haven't got them on the track, I just record that information and have a look at it before I go out there next time. Um, having worked for the government for 33 years, I've got a real hatred of recording things. I had a guts full of it. So most of my records are one line. Well, not, not even a whole line. They're only part of a, part of a line on a full scap page. You don't have to write great detail, but you do need to record the vital things. What you did there, and the things you need to record is when, particularly when you put your strips in, when your strips came out, um, just, just, those, just record the vital information. I, I don't record things for the sake of recording them. So I just print these, print these pages out, um, keep, keep them in, a, in a, um, a loose leaf ring binder, and I don't throw them away. When, when the page is full and I go on to the ne next one, I take them out and I just keep them, keep them for reference. Okay. Have we? Okay. Um, now, the final point is, can I get my honey extracted? Now, I've seen a lot of people start off in a beekeeping operation, spend a lot of money, buy a lot of gear, they, they suddenly, they go from the, having three or four hives in the backyard where they've just been doing their own extraction, um, to suddenly get jumping up to 30 or 40 hives, and you know, you, in a good season you're going to get a, ton of, a, ton, a couple of ton, tons of honey. Um, they get through to Christmas time and then, oh, who's going to extract it? Now, each district has got people that do commercial extraction. Um, what happened in Gisborne, if, 
about six or seven years ago, there's two guys put up a new extraction plant at the same time, and they were ringing up people asking them to, hey, come and put a bit of, bit of honey through my, my plant to make it e help to make it economic for them. Um, the last two years, those guys have been turning people away because they're full. So before you spend a whole lot of money in really increasing your hive numbers, and you saw the amount of gear that was involved and the cost of it, talk to an extractor and say, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm planning on doing this. How are you going to have some capacity to extract my honey? Because it can cause an awful lot of heartache if you, you, know, if you can't get your, get your honey extracted um, either on time or, or in, in your own district. Okay, so I've, co I've covered quite a lot of ground. Um, I hope it's given you a few ideas to work on. Um, but these are a few things that I, I run over with my trainees when I'm running training courses. And I, I know I would have found them very helpful to have had, had that when I started. So you've got, we've got plenty of time for questions. Um, uh, so we'll Okay, a, a site, a beekeeping site is, uh, we probably should be using the microphone, should we? <laughs> okay, the, the, the question was, um, how many, so, how, how, what do you, how large is, should a site be? Okay. A site, as far as the apiary database, is any, any group of bees that are kept less than, what is it, 300 metres away from another lot? Or 200 metres, 200 metres, is the, is the, that's the definition of a site. So if you've, on a farm, if you've got two or three sites on, a, on one farm that are more than that apart, as far as the apiary database is concerned, that's a site that you should register. Um, but yeah, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting is the numbers of hives for a site for your wintering, 30 or less, and for summer, you, you can have to work it out, but probably a good summer site you could certainly do 40 hives. You know, in a natural situation, you wouldn't have 30 hives all running together in one, one place, would you? Any other questions? If you are, just please come up to the microscope, uh, to the um, microphone. Okay. Um, just wondering, when you're um, checking the frames, uh, for the amount of bees that are on the frames, um, and obviously using a smoker, does that affect how many you see when you actually pull the lid off? Uh, the big thing is to do the same thing all the time. Yeah. So my hives, my, you know, my normal working practice, I just give, my, my bees are pretty quiet. I've been buying inseminated queens and, and I've got a good strain of bees. Um, and they're reasonably quiet, so I normally just give a hive two or three puffs of smoke in the front and then just quietly, quietly take the lid off. And as, as I'm lifting it up, I count those frames. Yeah. Now, you, what you've got to be careful, especially in a double, is you might you might count four frames in the in the top, and two, two in the two in the two or three in the bottom. Early on in the season, you've got to do a bit of a judgment: is are those bees just sitting in the top little bit of the frame, or are they going right down? Um, but it it doesn't matter too much as long as you're consistent in what you're doing. Because what you're trying to do, work out is what's that bee numbers now as it compared with what it was three weeks ago? So is the hive going backwards or forwards? And if, you know, if I see an increase in bee numbers, um, I know that the hive's going forward. All right? The question down there? Oh, um, two questions. Uh, the first one is, how many, uh, what's your recommendation, how many hives per hectare? And the second one is, um, if you can't get your honey extracted, how long can you hold on to that honey? Okay, so the first question is, how many hives per hectare? Per hectare was the per question. Hectare. Yes, how many, how many hives per hectare? Oh, there's no, <laughs> there's no one answer to that one. <laughs> like, like, say for example, MPI say one, one hive per hectare? No, it can certainly do a whole lot more than that. Well, you know, if you, you put 30 hives together in one site, and if you were lucky not to have another apiary within a hectare of you, um, the, the bees are going to do reasonably well. 
So that so that's that's thirty. Um, but it depend it depends on. See, see what, what what we haven't discussed is a B site. I don't know. Are you going, are you getting into that or? Okay, so when, when you're looking at a B site, it, you, you've got to look at the whole year. Um, you saw some pictures in, in America of what they, what they raise their, their bees on, um, those big massive bee areas, and they've got hundreds of hives building up for their pollination, um, almond pollination. Now that, that is the absolute worst thing you could do, of course. So that's all totally artificially fed. So you, you've got to look at you've got to look at a, a bee site and say, well, what have I got here that's going to flower during the year? Not not just is it going to flower over the have you got plenty of manuka for the for the for a honey crop? Because a lot of manuka sites don't have anything much for the rest of the year. So and this is what the whole trees for bees program is for is actually planting trees and particularly pollen-bearing trees that, that are going to flower and cover in these gaps. Um, the, the biggest gap in my area is often w your bees will winter okay. Most areas have got some willow, and I'm talking about willow honey that's from, from the willow flowers. Um, and then th the willow finishes in our area, most of it, um, end of September. In October, um, there's often not much for the bees. And we've been doing a lot of planting up there to fill in this October gap. Um, by November, it start, the clover's starting to flower. If the sun shines, it gets over 20 degrees and they'll bring clover in. Um, so it, there, is no, there is no answer to how many bees per hectare. It depends on what forage you've got available. See, the problem with bees is that you, you, can't, you can't just look at a beehive and say it's... Um, well nourished or undernourished, you know. If you if you if you start running sheep or cattle, you put them in a paddock. When 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 they, when they run out of feed and they stand at the gate and they bellow, uh, or or they get skinny and start falling over and there's no grass, you you know they've got haven't got much. But with beekeeping, it's much much more subtle than that. Now the, your other question was, oh, if you can't find anyone to extract your honey, um, how long can you hold on to it? Oh, how long can you hold your honey? Okay, um, we had a problem with that. I was, I was doing medical honey, which had to be kept really hygienic and couldn't, couldn't sit around for a long time. Um, you can freeze honey. And once you freeze it, you can keep it frozen for months. So we used to freeze it and then take it out and, and it would... Um, it was good, it killed all the wax moth. <laughs> it cost a bit of money, um, but it was manica honey that was going to go and hopefully go into the medical grade and make my fortune. Um, so that can be kept for quite a while. Uh, if you're just storing it at room temperature, you've got to be watching with wax moth and other problems. So you, I don't know, you probably won't, don't want to be storing it for more than a month, I wouldn't have thought. But don't, don't, don't delay your honey harvest because you can't get it extracted straight away. I would say store it somewhere. Got another question up here, yeah. Paul, which we'll just pass over to. I think one of the things that you've missed up there going commercial is the cost of actually doing it and the fact that you only get an income um, from honey once a year. So if you make the big step, then I'd say realistically you need a couple of years worth of savings or a lovely partner that's got to keep working to be able to support you during that transition till you get to a big enough stage whereby you're economically viable. Because yep. it's all well and good to know that you need so many boxes and so many of this or that, but you need another line in the spreadsheet that says how much does that cost and how much are your living costs during that time. Okay, I think Bryce is going to go into some of that after uh, afternoon tea. Um, from my personal, my history, what I've done, uh, when, I, when I left the government, I had 60, as I said, I had 60 hives. For the first 12 months, I worked for, an, helped set up another beekeeping operation um, and did that for 12 months, so that got me through the first year. Um, I do a little bit of consultancy work, and I've got a wife that's a nurse. <laughs> um, and I had some superannuation from the government, so from leaving my first job. So I, I had, yeah, you, you're going that first couple of years, you're going to need some extra income. 
That's a very good question, and that's at the basis of what we're going to talk about later on. It's, it's risk mitigation, yeah. which is essential that you have your go and eyes wide open. Yeah. Any other questions? We can. We go, go to have asked, or what? Hi, it was just a question on harvest. Um, you've got harvesting in January, February. Yep. I've heard of people harvesting in November, December. Yes. If, if, if you can progressively harvest, it's absolutely the best way of producing honey. Because you take off the first lot of honey boxes, get them extracted, and you put those stickies or wets, whatever you want to call them, back on the hives, and there's nothing to actually stimulate a hive as, as much as putting a whole lot of wets back on. Um, so if you can progressively harvest, it's good. Um, it keeps your different honey types separate. Um, but not everybody's got access to an extractor uh, if, if you're getting commercial extraction done to be able to do that. Yeah, we're talking about that further later on if you like, but that's, yeah, that's the norm for a lot of people. We get two crops, we get a bush crop or whatever, and then a white clover crop or something later on, and there's some, some uh, balances to do. But, yep. Uh, supplementary to that, does that actually uh, create more honey by extracting essentially twice? I think so. Um, it's very hard to do a controlled experiment, I suppose. No, as one of the speakers this morning said, nobody, nobody ever does half an apiary, do they? <laughs> but yeah, no, it stimulates the bees. Um, but it's my feeling with bees, you, you can't really trick bees. They're only going to do what they're going to do. But there's nothing, nothing wrong with giving them a helping hand. <laughs> I'm just going to add to that, and it will depend on the area you're living in. So um, a lot of my beehives are in the urban areas, um, and there's a lot more flow, longer period of flow. So I usually extract before Christmas and um, put, that, put the wet stickies back on, and yes, that stimulates them into getting all the Pahutikawa honey. Um, around the area and then I'll do a late harvest which then the wets are, are dry so they go on the top. Um, another one I do as a hobbyist would be under super. So I'm really encouraging them to finish that top box and giving them plenty of room and a real stimulation of space to store honey in. So, um, so when I'm, my first box goes on above the brood box and then as that's three quarters full, I then have my second box and that three quarter filled box goes above and the other one underneath. And that just stimulates them more into harvesting. It yeah, just to let you along that point, one other factor we've got these days with beekeeping, you all heard of the giant willow aphid? Okay, so for me in Gisborne, if we leave honey boxes on and from February on, um, all the bees want to do is fill it, fill it up with giant willow aphid honey. So for me now, um, getting it off at the end of January, the first week of February, is about as far as I want to go. Um, if I leave my half-empty boxes on, um, the bees will fill it up with giant willow aphid. It goes, takes it into my extractor, it clogs up his spin float, um, it tastes terrible. You can still sell it. It's still, people still buy it. I don't, I'm blown if I know why. I don't. I don't like the taste of it, but um, some people don't mind it so much. So I tend to let the bees fill up with it on the giant willow aphid. That it's actually a, a honeydew. Um, I'll, I'll leave that on for the winter feed. It's not a great winter feed because a lot of it crystallizes out. So if you've got three frames of honey, you've probably only got about two frames of actually feed value. Uh, it depends on how pure it comes in. And I'm just going to add one more. You might be har harvesting a specialty honey. So that once a year extraction is quite hard to um, contain those separate flavours. So um, again, bush honey comes off end of spring and then you'll get your summer honey and like um, Bryce gets, he gets his last season honey. You know, I have a bush crop, uh, a canuka crop, and a white clover crop, so and they, they need to be kept distinctly separate. 
So, uh, yes, you do end up uh, harvesting different times. Yep. Any more questions? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Just wait hang on, hang on a minute. Mic. Wait for the mic. Yeah, have you guys had any experience with Karaka? Uh, quick answer, no. Yeah. <laughs> I thought Gisborne grows a lot of Karaka trees. That area. Yeah. Yeah. For me, a quick answer is yes. <laughs> um, and also, um, I am in communication with our Auckland Council because they spray the Karaka. So they inform me when they... I've got some bees right in the centre of Auckland and they inform me when they're going to spray them so that Karaka doesn't go to a seed, you know, the little nut seed, um, and mess up their council land. So um, it's about that and yes I have found Karaka can affect bees. You've also got to remember that Kofi in spring can affect the bees. Any other questions? All right. Um, so what we might do, we've got another um, 10 minutes before we send you out for our break. So that's good to be ahead of time because um, I can drag myself on <laughs> forever in the afternoon. And um, also it means after our break and when we're finished, we've got a little bit more time for, I'm sure, a lot more questions that you'll have later in the day. So I'm going to stay at the mic for now. I usually like to wander around out the front and wave my arms around, so at least I can wave my arms around. So we're going to move on to um, handling of bees and, and hints, okay? So it's, it's going back to something like the real beginning beekeeping, but it might be something you haven't considered or it might be something that just reminds you of, of things. Um, so one of the first things I like to point out is can you see? All right, you really need to go and check your eyesight. Um, you need to be able to see the eggs in a frame. Um, it's going to help you, rather than you looking for that queen on all those frames, to be able to see an egg. Um, it's also going to help you when you want to lo um, look in those perforated cappings, any chewed cappings. Right, you can look in there and see nice pearly white, it might be related to varroa, or you can look in there and it's, it's, it's not looking so healthy, so then you'll investigate. The next thing is you need to have good light behind you. Okay, occasionally we're beekeeping under a tree or it's a cloudy day, um, we generally don't beekeep in the rain, sometimes when we're commercial we have to, um, but good beekeep, good light behind you so you can see into those perforated cappings and you can see those eggs. Um, the next one is um, to really know the appearance of healthy brood patterns and that's going to change throughout the seasons. Right, so it's not always going to be a, a full frame of brood. We're going to have um, varroa building up in our hives at different times of the year, and um, our bees, some of them can be quite hygienic and they're uncapping those cells, so maybe the pattern starts getting a little bit spotty. But we also need to know the difference between a healthy capped brood and an unhealthy capped brood. So those are some basic hints. Just keep them in mind. Um, when I'm handling my bees, I have my beekeeping kit. All right? um, it's there always. And there are just some reminders as well. Keep your bee suit clean. All right? um, and if you're cleaning it, wash it separately. Store it separately. It's quite important to um, avoid allergies building up in your family. Your bee suit can be covered with um, venom, and that venom can dry up into powder and then it's in the air in your home. Or it, if it goes into your clothing, then it's mixing up with your clothing that you're just going to put back in your drawers. Um, we've seen a lot of beekeepers, family members, become allergic to bee, bees. And uh, that bit more precaution there can help you in the long run and your family members. 
Um, I also like to keep my smoker clean. It's going to actually lengthen the life of my smoker. It's going to give me um, good smoke. Right? We want a nice, cool, clean smoke. I'm just going to remind you of that in case you'd forgotten. You don't want a flame coming out of it. And the most important thing is um, storing that smoker somewhere safe. Right? It could be in your garage. Okay, are we certain that it's out and you don't have something come along and knock it over? Um, I, I've learnt by experience it's been basically smoker on the back seat of the car and I've had to stop suddenly and that's fallen off and down onto the carpet and before I know it, by the time I, I think it was that occasion I was going over the Harbour Bridge and before I got over the other end the carpet was on fire in, my, in the back of the car. And I thought my smoker was out for sure. Don't rely just on touch. It can have an ember right inside there. So I like to store my smoker in a, a, a safe fire box. Um, hive tool, scorching. It just removes that honey and propolis and anything, any spores. And we'll talk about that AFB. You know, if you practice this all the time, you're diluting any risks of spread. Um, so cleaning wax propolis off is, is just one of those things to do at the end of the day and one of those things to do between apiaries and even hive visits if you start doing an apiary sort of or hive visit quarantine. Um, again, it can be stored in a um, tin can between apiaries with a bit of uh, janola to keep it uh, sterilising itself as it's going along. And um, if, you, if you've done your AFB decker, you will remember, I hope, that your gloves are to be cleaned in soapy water. Why? It's diluting, it's a degreaser, and it's going to be removing all the honey sticky off, the propolis and the wax and the pollen off, all right? It's going to be degreasing, it's just diluting any risk factors again when you go on to something else. So those are things that I actually practice every day, even though I don't have AFB in my apiaries. Because I, uh, my apiaries, nearly all of them, are in red areas. Do you know what a red area is? Okay, so you go onto your API website, you log in and you check your apiary data, and you're either going to have your apiary come up red or blue. Red means there's been an AFB reported incident within a couple of K radius, I think it is. So that's all right. You know, there's AFB in the area. Well, I'd like to be safe to know that my five hives are going to be um, protected. Right, so I start putting in these apiary quarantines and anything. It, it just helps with my hive management and I'll talk about that a little bit more. So my practice is between that, leaving that high risk area and moving on to another apiary area is, is I've diluted any risk of spreading it to another apiary area. Some of the other things I like to keep in my daily box is um, cleaners, so I've got the janola, I've got the um, soapy water, um, I've got any sp you know sprayer to just spray things with, I've got water because of course I need the water to drink because beekeeping is pretty hot work, but also to add to that soapy water, um, so it's another cleaning agent, you can't just put the um, palm olive straight on to your gloves. Anyway, I've also got a towel to do a little bit of cleaning if I need to. Matches. Now, that's not just to light the lighter, but that might be because I want to investigate a cell. And that goes back to that perforated capping. All right, you can dig in with your hive tool, but if you just go and get your box of matches that is in your kit, break off the red end, and you've got a jagged end and you've got a rough surface, just in case it's that AFB, but you can just take that capping off and look inside the cell with damage, without damaging the cell and other cells around it. 
right, without digging in, just matches is just so handy. And of course, there might be something you're not sure of, so collecting a sample, you've got your match there. So that's why I actually carry little plastic bags around as well, just in case I want to collect a sample and where am I going to put that um, dead bee, for instance? It can go in a, a plastic bag, and then I can go down the pathway that I need to. Um, marking pens. Now, I do hive quarantines, so um, and I also, like, if I'm taking a box off a hive, and it's off hive one, and I've got five hives, I want to make it sure it goes back to hive one, I'm marking it. There, I've got always marking systems in place, and we're going to look at a little bit more uh, afterwards. Um, all those marking systems that you can put in place, and these are actually systems that you can put in place today, rather than, as I say, a problem happening or a problem coming up. You're already putting a system there to guarantee you don't have to worry about the whole apiary. So those are just a couple of them. I'll do one more, and then we're going to have a quick break. So these are s s silly little things, but you know they're, they're, they make a difference. Always be prepared before you visit. Know what you're going to do or what your aim is there. Um, be prepared as even actually having your smoker actually working, not lifting the lid and the smoker's going gone out. Right? I really believe in being prepared. It's about wearing that protective clothing and wearing it correctly. Um, when you're starting beekeeping, I. I probably would recommend dressing well and as you become more confident then start de-dressing okay wear the gloves first as you become more confident okay take your gloves off and and feel the bees a bit better um, I like to always work from the bottom up when I'm looking at brood and it's a just one of those silly hints rather than going to the second brood box take that second brood box off go down to the bottom, and of course if you're doing that full AFB inspection of the brood, you need to be able to do that because you don't want to shake your bees from the top box into the bottom box and then go down to it and start looking at those frames because it's just going to agitate the bees more. And while I'm doing that, I always, um, whenever I'm taking something off the hive, especially we know in autumn and winter, um, I want to avoid all the pheromones or the smells going out of that box, so I cover it over with a bit of hessian. Hence, that's one of the things that is always in my daily kit that I'm going out in the field with. Um, the other one I really, really like to see is my bees remain calm. And so banging and crashing and hammering and that is, is really going to upset them. And um, you know, you hear of beekeepers that, oh, I got 50 stings a day. Well, why are you getting 50 stings a day? It's about handling your bees with a bit of respect, and they're going to respect you back. So um, banging and crashing methods, just avoid them. You know, just handle those girls with a little bit of care. And I'm going to break there and say, go and enjoy some afternoon refreshments, and we'll come back. <laughs>